I actually was a very closed minded person. I was a skeptical debunker of all wow. of this stuff. I hated conspiracies and UFOs and psychics and religion and consciousness and spirituality. It wasn't just wrong. It was offensive to me. I, I thought it was immoral to spread pseudoscience and conspiracy theories. And I had other skeptic friends who would be like, oh, I want to believe, but I can't. And I would say, why do you want to believe? I'm glad it's not real. I don't want to live in a universe where any of this shit is real. Like, I'm very happy living in a cold, <laughs> dead, impersonal, meaningless universe. And so uh, I didn't have like a UFO sighting that changed my life. It actually, that never happened. Uh, instead, it was it was like death by a thousand cuts. You know, it was, mm -hmm. you know, just constantly being exposed to more and more information and struggling to debunk it. Welcome to Far Out Faust, everybody. I am Faust Chicho, and today I am excited and I am honored to be joined by Michael Mazzola. Let me tell you about this incredible man and what he has been up to. He is the director of some of the most influential and iconic UFO documentaries of all time, including my absolute personal favorites, which many of you have watched if you've been following and listening to me, Unacknowledged, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, Missing 411, The UFO Connection, and most recently, a very, very important documentary. If you have not seen it, see it ASAP. It's called The Lost Century. As a producer and a UFO consultant for film and TV, working with some of the most prestigious artists and companies in Hollywood, he strives to bring authenticity and integrity to how UFO stories are told. Michael also co-founded Entangled, and that's a quantum physics R&D company in Irvine, California, and has grown numerous businesses in the cyber intelligence, cyber marketing, blockchain, and entertainment sectors. He sits on the board of the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance, whose mission is to bridge the gap between Hollywood filmmakers and real experiencers and experts. He studied film and TV at NYU. And um, without further ado, Michael, thank you so much for beaming in. It is an honor to have you, brother. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. How did you end up first uh, first of all like were you recommended to dr to 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 dr greer how did you end up in his you know um and then obviously he loved loved your work because he he kept using you and you went on to produce and and direct my absolute highly recommended i mean i have this list on my youtube channel that i keep sending everyone to it's called faust highly recommends i don't know what else to call it but all your docs are on there they're they're all top of my list and i'm constantly telling people like you know you need to understand the situation um in order to believe what i'm saying <laughs> but uh how did you meet him how, how, or how did how did you end up working with him uh so first of all thank you so much um for the compliments i i'm i'm not used to hearing this kind of feedback so i really really appreciate it um so uh, I, I didn't know him. I had donated to Sirius, the first movie he did yeah. with Armady Kalika. And I got to go to the premiere in LA and I, I tried to shake his hand at the premiere, but there were like, there was an entourage there that was like, go, go away, you know, go away, creepy person. Um, but I met uh, Adam Curry at the, uh, at the premiere. He was in Sirius. Um, I, I thought he was the most impressive part of that film. Uh, he's a consciousness researcher and inventor. So I went up to him and we became friends. He's now my best friend and we've started businesses together. And so we were, we were working on building a, um, a quantum physics R&D company. And I was, you know, still watching Greer all the time on YouTube and reading his books and everything. And I saw Greer put out a call for a filmmaker. He says in one of his videos, oh, we're looking for someone to make the next documentary. And I got so excited. 
But then I saw that this video was like six months old and I thought, oh, well, oh. you know, there's no way. But just in case, I'll send an email. So I sent a cold email and a few days later, I was on the phone with, uh, with Dr. Greer and, um, you know, a month later, I moved to Charlottesville, Virginia and signed a lease <laughs> and, you know, started, uh, started going through, you know, the archives, which are all just in, his, wow. you know, in boxes in his basement, just <laughs> thousands of, he calls it the mouse turd files. <laughs> and it's, a, it's an accurate description, right? Just thousands of CIA documents, just, you know, so like looking for the gems and um, yeah, that's, that's how it got started. Wow. That's amazing. What a, what a, what a call to be returned six months later, you know, you're like, fuck it. I'll just, I would have been the same thing. I would have been like, there's no way that this position is still open, but what the hell yeah. I'll email anyway. That's amazing. And so you, so you had to, you had to pick up and move where you were, were you in California or were you in New York? Yeah, I was born and raised in LA, went to school in New York and came straight back. And, uh, you're like, it's too yeah. fucking cold there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, wow. That's amazing. So you, 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 how long did you end up having to stay, um, in proximity to, I mean, cause documentaries, sometimes they take years to, to collect. Yeah. Out. I, I ended up in Charlottesville for only about six months okay. and then we moved the production to Vegas and then I finished it in California. So it was a little, a little bit chaotic. Um, but, uh, it ended up working out and I never thought anyone would see that movie, you know, wow. like I thought, Oh, this will go on Vimeo and maybe a few <laughs> thousand people would see it. Like I had, I had no idea that, you know what it was about to do and and it was just com i was in complete shock for the longest time <laughs> you know yeah i mean it's really hard to quantify how many people saw that movie because it's been around and it's been you know it was on you know youtube i mean dr Greer thinks that probably a billion people saw it i don't know that's a huge number i don't know if that many people saw it but certainly i think you broke into the hundreds of mil hundreds of millions. Um, yeah. I think well, between all the copies that have gone around and the, you know, the pirating and, and all that. Yeah. And that, that's how we kind of figured out kind of a ballpark um, because our, our distributor wasn't very good at dealing with the piracy. So we, we were working with a, a cyber marketing firm that also could do piracy. And we're like, Hey, can you just, do an assessment of how badly this movie is getting pirated. And they came back with something like, you know, 600 million torrent streams, wow. you know, wow. some, some insane number. And this was at the end of 2017. Right. Yeah. So I think he kind of extrapolates from there. It's like, okay. So if it's like 600 million at that point, and then you add in, you know, five mm -hmm. years, and Netflix and Hulu and the sales we know about, it's, it's a lot, you know? Yeah. That's amazing, dude. That's, I mean, I'll never forget, you know, the, when Mick Jagger was on Rogan, you know, and I'm going to show that, that, uh, that clip. Oh, Steven yeah. Tyler. Steven Tyler. Yeah. 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 What did I say? Mick Steven Tyler was on Rogan. And Have you not watched Unacknowledged? What is Unacknowledged? You got to watch Unacknowledged. What is that one? Okay. You got to watch Unacknowledged. What is it? You got to watch Unacknowledged. Is that that Stephen Greer movie? He was, and it, it's so funny because Dr. Greer was on Rogan when Rogan was much more of a hardcore skeptic. And, and so the whole vibe of their interview is just like, you're like, I mean, you're watching it six years later and you're like, what the fuck is, what is going it's on so with cringy. this guy? You, you know it's, what I mean? It's so cringy. I can't watch it. It's so bad. No. It makes me so God. uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And I'm like, what is, what is happening? What? And then I realized how long ago it was and he, you know, Rogan goes through phases. No, I don't think he's going through any more phases now. Now the kind of the cat's out of the bag, but um, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, it sucks. I wish he'd have him back on, but you know, so, so tell me what, what did you, obviously you had a very open mind if you, you know, you, you, like myself, you know, you, you donated to, um, to Dr. Gers films. You, you know, I was actually supposed to go to the premiere of close and of CE five close encounters of the fifth kind. And I was, and I had plans to meet Dr. Gers cause we were long story short, we were trying to get him to be 
on a show we were doing called The Last Supper. Um, and it was this show we were just launching where I was going to go around and, and, um, and shoot what would be whatever this, whatever the, the enlightened person that we chose as our guest, Dr. Greer would have been the first, whatever he would have, if this was his last meal on, on earth. And then I was going to ask him, you know, these, these 15 questions we laid out about, you know, about life, about the cosmos and, and we were going to make a a show. Yeah. We were going to do a different guru, you know, slash person who we, who we really loved and admired and um, for every episode. And then of course, you know, Sklovid, you know, the, the, uh, the shit hit the fan with the, <laughs> with the, with the, uh, fascists, fascists of the world. And, uh, and then everything got shut down and I couldn't even go to the premiere. I was so disappointed. Same. I couldn't go either. You know, um, I probably would have met you there. <laughs> yep. But so, so, but what, is, so before you, before you started working on this film, you know, you, you probably had a few ideas about what was true. And then once you got into the, the basement and then shooting this and coming out of it, how much of your understanding and beliefs changed? You know, like how, how, how blown away were you? Well, Maybe you a few there. years before I even knew about Dr. Greer and donated to Sirius, I actually was a very close minded person. I was a skeptical debunker of all of this stuff. I hated conspiracies and UFOs and psychics and religion and consciousness and spirituality. It wasn't just wrong. It was offensive to me. I I thought it was immoral to spread pseudoscience and conspiracy theories. And I had other skeptic friends who would be like, oh, I want to believe, but I can't. And I would say, why do you want to believe? I'm glad it's not real. I don't want to live in a universe where any of this shit is real. Like, I'm very happy living in a cold, (laughs) dead, impersonal, meaningless universe. And so... Uh, I didn't have like a UFO sighting that changed my life. Actually, that never happened. Uh, instead, it was it was like death by a thousand cuts. You know, it was, mm. you know, just constantly being exposed to more and more information and struggling to debunk it. Um, and, you know, I, I was really looking at arguments against my own position, not because I thought I might be wrong, but because I wanted to just defeat any argument mm. that came my way. I was such an asshole. Like I loved <laughs> to fight with people. And, and so, you know, but, but when you read like Dean Radin's books, and if you look at Dr. Greer's material, you can't debunk it. The, you know, the skeptics motto, which was my motto, which is, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, the extraordinary mm. evidence is there. Right. And when I realized it was there and it's been there for decades, I was like, oh, these skeptics that I'm, you know, idolizing, you know, like Michael Shermer and James Randi, they're total bad faith actors. You know, Mm. they're completely insincere. And and then I had to ask myself, well, why is it that I didn't just not believe, but I also did not want it to be true. Mm -hmm. And the answer that came to me immediately is, well, if any of this stuff is true, you have to take responsibility for it, right? (laughs) So like, if the media is lying to us about everything, I can't just be a passive consumer of information. I have to, you know, now it's gonna be my full-time job to fact check everything, you know? if we're living in a universe where our consciousness has some kind of relationship with the fabric of reality, (laughs) I have to take responsibility for my thoughts. That's horrifying. Right. (laughs) If if I, I was, I was depressed. Right. I was not like, Oh my God, I'm this powerful being. It was more like, Oh my God, I have all (laughs) all this toxic shit. And if there's really a UFO cover up, I can't just keep that to myself. So, I have, I have a lot of um, compassion for our skeptical or cynical brothers and sisters because it's not about evidence. It's never been about evidence, it, or at least it hasn't been about evidence for decades. It's about you know, the responsibility that we're asking yeah. 
these people to take on, it's enormous. I mean, this completely transformed every aspect of my life. So we, I think we have to have some compassion for what we're actually asking yes. people to do. And we say, Hey, come join our movement. So anyway, I, um, so the way that I was going to take responsibility for all this stuff was I was going to make films because that's the only thing I knew how to do. So that's why I put my hand up and said, Hey, I would love to do this. Wow. That's fucking incredible. I had no idea that I, I really would have never expected that, that, but that is music to my ears because one of the people listening to this um, <laughs> will be someone who I work closely with, who is my resident skeptic as well. He's more of a traditional skeptic. I, I the, the thing about everything you're saying is absolutely true. And, and, you know, I, I, I have a lot of, I try to have a lot of compassion for skeptics because I know that that there's a subconscious element to their skepticism that many of them have not unearthed and and I and I believe just like you said you know it manifests itself consciously in a lot of ways it's like you know evidence and all this stuff and 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 sometimes that'll sway but but more so I feel like there's a there's you know there's this and I and I don't know how else to phrase it but it's it, it is in part due to uh, uh, you know, an innocent kind of good heartedness, like an, an, an inability to realize that the world could possibly be so fucking corrupt and, and fucked up, you know, first of all, because that's an avalanche, you know, for people who have certain belief systems, you know, to, to acknowledge how broken our system is, is, is a, is a, it's a paradigm shift that I think most people you know, they don't have the spiritual fortitude to take it yet, you know, and, and many of them need to die by a thousand cuts as you did, um, yeah. and come around to it. But, uh, you know, I, I think that on the other side of it is a much more fulfilling life, you know, um, that, that you can be responsible for. And, and, and I, and I hear you, you know, it's like when you realize just how much you're responsible for and how, conscious you have to be of your thoughts and feelings it's like you know it's a fucking slap in the face <laughs> it is you it know? is that's why i found comfort in a cold dead and personal universe because i wasn't responsible for anything yeah you know i'm a victim of circumstance you know mm -hmm. um and uh you know when i made unacknowledged that was just my way of processing my trauma of mm -hmm. like confronting all this terrifying shit that's in that movie you know mm -hmm. but now however many years later you know six years later whatever it's been um you know now i i have um, a lot of regrets about you know the mis the mistakes i've made in communicating with other people about this information mm -hmm. and right and so right now my my main focus is how can we um interact with this information with these with these truths with these revelations uh with these mysteries in a way that makes our life better that makes us happier and enriches us instead yeah. of just scaring the shit out of us and making us feel powerless you know yes. it's a challenge you know i mean i i i am uh you know the the, the truther community that's a wide range of folks right now um and some of us are, are more spiritually minded than others. Um, and, and some of us, you know, ha have a better grasp on this, but, but you realize you can't be going around and slapping people in the face with the truth. You know, you're, first of all, it's a, the, it's your, your first step forward is a, is a very negative reinforcement, you know, that is, you know, going to be right in the face of that ego, that whoever it is, and they're going to be much, much less susceptible to the information if you have you know fucking pulled their pants down and slapped them in the face in front of everyone and been like this is how fucking wrong you are be afraid be very afraid you know the world is not what you thought they're going to be like you know you can put them in denial and shock so it's a constant challenge you know how to present information where you can at, at least get them to take a step forward on that bridge, you know, that they need to cross in order to see things the way that they are, as opposed to, you know, the veil that's been put down. So I hear you. 
it's a struggle. <laughs> it's definitely a struggle. It is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are, there are other mistakes and other things I figured out along the way, too. I'm happy to share some embarrassing stories if you want. Sure, you know? man. Sure. You know, I mean, look, it's the first thing I think many of us do when we have this awakening is is fucking run and tell everyone. It's like, and it's, you know, like the, the fucking mailman's at the door. You're like, dude, <laughs> did you know? And people just think that you're a little crazy, but then you realize like, okay, that's, um, maybe this isn't the best course of action, but I want to hear your story. Yeah, but I, I fucking ran and I told everyone, I told <laughs> hundreds of millions of people. And I should have, you know, in retrospect, maybe thought about, uh, you know, a, a solution I was going to offer, you know, now that I've alerted everyone to this, you know, <laughs> global fascist takeover, yeah. you know, instead of just leaving people with that, you know, but uh, it's okay. We, we all make mistakes. Yeah, well, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, as they say. Um, but, you know, you, you, the great thing you, that you did do was it was the first time, I think, that an official, you know, true expose came out that gave people the whole story if they were fucking patient enough to stay to the third act, you know, and I tell everyone don't miss the third act because it's everything you need to understand the third act for everything else to make sense. It's the, it's, you. you know, it's the reward for sitting through the first two, which is, you know, it becomes uncomfortable for people to, to, to be bombarded, you know, with, with all that information. And then finally they're like, okay, okay, I get it. And, but then, you know, the third act is like, look, this is why. Do you understand? Do you understand now? So I, I love I love the way you structured it, um, and you couldn't have structured it any other way. But I hear you. But I mean, you got you you had to feel some redemption with uh, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. I mean, don't oh. get me wrong. It was a, itself. It, it was a warning itself. But yeah. at least there was some hope in it. <laughs> oh yeah, you know. But I, you know, again, I thought, okay, well, sure, unacknowledged was popular because that was, you know that was designed to do what you just said. It was designed to bring people from zero to 60 in two hours, you know, people who not, knew nothing. It was the movie you could put in front of your grandmother and red pill her, you know, mm -hmm. which is what I was hoping Sirius was going to be, you know, and I really mm -hmm. liked Sirius and I think it's a great film, but you had people doing CE5 10 minutes into the film. So I tried showing that to my mom and my sister and they're like, what the fuck is that? You got people telepathically yeah. what the fuck is that you know because they weren't even on board with ufos being real no, but let alone we could telepathically summon them so i'm like oh shit you know so when i i connected with dr greer i was so happy that we were totally in alignment on this that it's like yeah no ce5 in this movie no. this is just about this is disclosure potty training right mm -hmm. so by the time we got to ce5 i'm like yeah well no one's going to want to see this movie because this is way too weird so I was right back in the same place of thinking no one's no one's going to want to see this, you know, and then it yeah. was it was even bigger than unacknowledged. And I'm just sitting there like, what the fuck is going on? And, and I've seen things happen in the last few years that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. And that's when I realized, well, it's not, you know, it's not because I'm such a good filmmaker. It's not because we have these amazing budgets because we, we don't, you know, <laughs> and it's not because these are the greatest films ever made. They're far from it. You know, they're little crowdfunded documentaries. Um, it's because there's a, a higher intelligence that's shining through them. Not mine. I'm not, it's, I'm not saying <laughs> it's my higher intelligence shining yeah. through it. But there's, you know, it, it, it's, it's the same higher intelligence that's been guiding this movement, you know? And, um, and Dr. Greer, he he fucking knows it. You know, he yep. knew that unacknowledged was going to accomplish what it did. And same thing with CE five. And, you know, he's the visionary behind these things. And I had no faith at all, but I just said, okay, it's my job. I'm going to just do it, you know, and do the yeah. best I can. Th listen, you are a conduit, my friend. Um, you, you deserve some credit because you sent the email and you got the job and then you got another job and you were the right man for the job. Those films speak for themselves. They're, they're very, very easy to watch. They get better and better. I mean, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind is as awesome as Unacknowledged is. Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, in my opinion, was a, a step up in filmmaking. You know, it, it just, I know that maybe the budget was a little bigger, 
Um, and I also want to clarify. No, it was things. smaller. It was smaller. But no I was shit. figuring. I was figuring out how to make a movie because Unacknowledged yeah. was the first one. You know, I'd only wow. done little short things in school. So. So for for people who don't who have no experience making films, as you learn how to make films, you can make better films for less money. Like the first film I made was fucking astronomical. I mean, it was like it was almost half a million dollars in budget. Oh shit! <laughs> and, and and it was a it was an independent thriller. We didn't make our money back. Okay, the next film I made was for two hundred thousand dollars just as good as a film. It was a thriller. They ended up marketing it as a horror and we sold it to IFC and we made our money back. Um, it was, a, it was a much, it was a harder film to make, but we made it for like not even half. And then I learned how to do it again and again. So, so that's what Michael is, is talking about, but dude, so that film, Man, I love that film. It's, I mean, it's just so, it's so prophetic with everything that happened. It just made all, you know, Daniel Sheehan and all those guys, they're just telling you what's happening. And then of course it happens. <laughs> and then it happens. You know, I mean, Danny know. Sheehan sitting there saying to the stars Academy is a shady intelligence, counterintelligence operation, you know, and mm -hmm. it's just pushing this phony threat agenda. And then Lou Elizondo quits to the stars Academy and hires <laughs> Danny Sheehan as his yeah. attorney. Now, Danny's one of my best friends and I can't divulge personal conversations, but if we just apply a little bit of logic, <laughs> it seems like he might've been onto something, you know, yeah. it's not that he changed his mind about what TTSA was, you know? Right. So, yeah, I mean, we, um, we, we shook those guys up and I'm, I'm very proud of that. You know, yeah. I take, I like, I, I give myself a little credit, I don't give myself credit for much, but I give myself a little credit for having uh, having a role in taking down TTSA. So. Yeah, and and look, I I think Daniel Sheehan is chock full of integrity. I think that if he's involved with them, it's because he wants to oversee you know whatever they're doing and whatever you know they're working on in a way that will c actually benefit people, you know, as opposed to continue the government secrecy. So, you know, I know that there was like a whole big melodrama with when, when Sheehan went to them and people were like, he's betrayed Dr. Greer. And I'm like, I'm sure that it wasn't, as, you know, I'm, I'm sure he had his reasons. I don't know yeah. how bad, if it was a breakup or what, but, um, you know, and then, you know, and then Danny was at our, uh, our event in DC on June 12th. The, the new the new disclosure press conference he was sitting right, right there in the front row you know so That's right. you know Great there's always ufo conference. politics you know and there's always going to be disagreements and whatever but you know ultimately um dr greer and danny are trying to accomplish the same thing yeah yeah and they work great in tandem together and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure they shook hands there. I'm sure that they, you know, said, Oh, I hope they did. You know, I, I love both men. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, they greeted yeah. each other with hugs and, you know, so Greer invited Danny. Danny to the yeah. event. So, Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. That's good news. I was always, you know, the, the internet loves to take a little spark of drama and turn it into a fucking bonfire. So I, I you know, I was like trying to find out the truth, but it's tough when you're using third party sources. Um, but, that's that's uh remarkable so so close encounters of the fifth kind so for for ever every so i you know like i do these um i make a lot of videos uh for youtube but i also do a lot of um live broadcasts mostly on instagram I, i'm starting to do more on on and i teach people about uh ce5 you know and about how to make contact and then i come up against some of the people who are you know more religious minded and they're like, you know, there's a fear factor involved and I encourage them, you know, I explain to them how, how the protocols work and, and where they come from. And, um, and I'm like, you, you know, you, you don't have, <laughs> you don't have to wait for, for them to land for, to connect, you know, you can, yeah. you can do this. Anybody who can, anybody with, you know, a functioning heart and mind can do this. You don't even need a lot of people. I was doing it in my Manhattan apartment by myself with a fucking headlamp on for many nights. Okay. Like a, like a, like a great fool. <laughs> uh, 
I even had it flashing a few nights. I was like, maybe this will help. <laughs> Did you have any orbs come in? Well, I was on the I was on the east side, and I was facing west because it was the only view I had, and um, and 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 I connected. I connected twice, I, and and I'll never forget it. I did. I couldn't. I never saw um, a ship, and I realized, you know, how the insanity of what I was looking to to do. You know, asking them to, you know, materialize in fucking Manhattan, so I could wave high but 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 i was like so i was really deep in in this in this beautiful void and 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 honestly it was like one of the deepest meditations i've ever got myself into and it was just it was just total black it was nothing it was like it was i was i was so far gone and and out of this nothing this ship appeared in my mind like and and i and it appeared through a cloud cover out of nowhere. And I was like, oh, you know, I, it, it snapped me out of my, my, this, this void I was in. And I was you were like, remote viewing that totally. And, and they were connecting with me and I was like, hello. <laughs> and, and, and it was just kind of like, I, I, I had this greeting, you know, of a feeling and I gave it back and it was, I was just like, thank you. And I was like, that's, that's what Dr. Greer means when he, when he says, you know, you, 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 you can connect, you know, um, you can remote view and you can connect. You don't have to do it physically. It can happen physically and it does, yes. but a lot of times it starts with that. Um, and so that was like, I would have doubted it, but I was like, it was, you know, it was like getting slapped in the face. I went, it wasn't something that I conjured up. It was, you know, it was just there vivid. Um, and I was like, wow, I would have woken up my wife, but, um, <laughs> it was late in the night yeah. <laughs> and I had a, dude, that is so on. cool. <laughs> and that's, that's a side of CE5 that actually never gets discussed very much. Everyone's so focused on, um, you know, phenomena manifesting, yeah. you know, so that we could film it, but there's been so many transcendent, amazing experiences that are just happening in consciousness and the truth is all of it's happening in consciousness yes. you know um mm -hmm. but uh that's really cool thank you for sharing that experience oh yeah so it's so i don't know if i've ever if i've ever shared that uh you know on a, on online before but it was it was i mean i'm always a little like people are gonna think i'm crazy like I, and maybe i was a little crazy but i was having fun and uh it, it people should know that 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 that, that Yes, there's a there's there's a there's a really amazing excitement and energy when you're with the right group of people, and then a craft shows up because it's undeniable. It's right in front of you. You know what I mean. And sometimes it's right right there on the ground. You know, some the, and and when you're seeing more than one, and you're like, this can't. You know, even even a hardcore skeptic is going to be a little blown away. I mean, they may walk away being like. How the fuck do they set up those lights? <laughs> yeah. You know, people have all kinds of ways that they, you know, I, they just write it off, but, um, but, but this other part of it, and I, and I'm like, look, you can be the greatest skeptic, but if you, if you, if you're willing to try, you know, you, you might be able to find out something that you don't know. Yeah. But you know, skeptics are skeptics. <laughs> yes, they are. Well, you know, it's, I, even when I was making CE5, I wasn't taking my own meditation practice very seriously. You know, I was still very much stuck in the, in the, in, in, in you know, fear-based consciousness of, mm -hmm. oh, we've got to, we've got to make this movie. We have to warn people about what's going on. And, you know, and it, it was, you know, kind of hypocritical. Because here we're talking about these beautiful things, but I wasn't practicing what I was preaching, really. You know, I would try here and there, but I just I super wasn't into it. And then, you know, with with COVID, um, I, I started really taking um, spirituality seriously and mm -hmm. having the most transcendent, incredible experiences in meditation oh, and also with psychedelics. And, you know, to our religious brothers and sisters, I, I cannot say it enough. You know, 
it's one thing to have beliefs about the spiritual realm and read about it and and have your convictions about it and it's another thing to actually um it, it directly touch that realm and experience god or whatever you want to call it it's 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 the difference between reading about sex and having sex like you can't even <laughs> you can't even imagine you know you you can't even imagine um and so you know uh, i as a result i've stopped trying to you know i i'm no longer oriented around you know uh, the mission of trying to wake people up and, and we got to get people on our team. And, you know, people come to me and say, Oh, I've seen your movies. And what do we, what do we do? What do I do? I say, have you done mushrooms? Have you tried LSD? <laughs> have you tried? Uh, do you, do you, do you <laughs> and they're like, what? I'm like, yeah. yeah, you know, here, you want a microdose? You know, I carry them around with me. Um, but, um, me <laughs> you know, yeah, there you go. It's, um, yeah. You know, it, it's a complete it's a complete 180 shift from where I was when I when I started making these films. And um, and and now I'm just, you know, completely monomaniacally focused on, um, you know, the, the frequency that I'm putting out there instead of being preoccupied with what the, the quote unquote bad guys are doing, because mm -hmm. what the bad guys are doing is is just a reflection of something that's broken within myself. Mm -hmm. And by getting stressed out about what's happening in the world, I'm, I'm just putting more energy into that. Yeah. And so this is where I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking, oh God, have I made these problems worse by bringing them to light? I, I've decided I don't think I have, um, but, um, but it, it's something I've, I've, I've wrestled with. And, and so now with, the the films we're working on i'm i'm making sure that like we still have like some crazy shit like we've got these new witnesses i don't know if you saw yeah. the event in oh, june yeah. you know i did yeah yeah okay so we've uh, i was I, gonna go but i but i i had a lot of obligations with my kids but i wanted to be there i had a lot of friends there yeah, yeah so but i mean great event yeah great event crazy stuff uh, they were on. They've done some podcasts, but they're making their film debut in this this film that we're editing now. Nice. Um, but I'm just making sure that this thing is like fun and mm -hmm. not going to stress people out, you know. Yeah. Um, and 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 just uh, not. I, I don't. I don't want to feed into the conspiracism and the and the 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 dialectic anymore. Yeah. See, part part of what I do is point out the dialectic. So, so I, I'm I'm in this space where people are like, "Man, you know," and I get this comment once in a while, and I don't know how to feel about it. But, but at the same time, I have to remind myself that ignorance is bliss right up until you die from it. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> and 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 I would rather people, and I try to present the information that that you know, it's something they could then look and say, holy shit, that's true. It's really true. You know, George Bush's brother really did work security for the world trade right up until 2001, while also being on a chair of Los Alamos, a company that makes the most advanced therm therm thermite explosives on the planet, you know, and, uh, and the Bushes are longtime family friends of the Bin Ladens. Go figure. George Sr. was having breakfast with the Bin Laden family in D.C. the morning of 9-11. Just, just a few coincidences for you, yeah. you know? Um, and, and people are like, why isn't this fact-checked? <laughs> and I'm like, because it's all fucking true. This, but it makes me very <laughs> uncomfortable, and I just want to say, buildings, buildings always pulverize themselves into dust when you poke a hole in them. I just want to be on record, you know? Yeah. It's true. So. Office fires can be deadly. Yeah. <laughs> um, people and, 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 and they're like, wow. They're like, I didn't know that, you know, it's so upsetting, but I'm so glad you told me. And I'm like, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you need to understand the world we're living in before we can change it. You know what I'm saying? So I, I feel you. And I, and I, 
you know, part of me just wants to make videos about quantum physics and, and about, you know, the heart mind connection and about how powerful we are and our innate ability to, to change this world and heal ourselves and do all these amazing things. But I also know that what gets traction and followers are also these other subjects, which people should know about, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I'm, I, but I'm constantly being like, how do I navigate this space? Because I know I'm not going to obsess over what they're doing. I know their plan. I know what they're always working towards. I'm, I'm going to focus on me. I have a daily spiritual practice. I'm pretty consistent with it. You know, I, I also 2020 was also a great liberator for me. Um, you know, I didn't have any of these tattoos before 2020. I was an oh, actor. Sick. And so I, I hid my, you know, what I wanted to do, I had to hide because I didn't want to be typecast, you know, and then 2020 came and I was like, I'm free. Uh, I'm my own. I'm a free agent now. You know, I'm no longer beholden to this notion. And, and I started to do things I loved. You know, the guy I was working with, great. Um, maybe, maybe you've heard of him. His name is Hunter Richards. He was, uh, he's a director. He's very spiritual. <laughs> um, he directed Sounds a film familiar. called Lo London um, with Chris Evans and Jessica Biel. Great film. Mm -hmm. He wrote it and directed it, but he's a very spiritual dude. And he was like, we have to do something. We're going to make a podcast. I'm like, we are. He's like, yeah, we can't just sit around like this because <laughs> we were shut down. He's like, you're going to host it. I'm like, all right. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I can't fucking host it. I don't get in front of the camera. Okay. You're going to host it. I'm going to help. I'm like, all right, let's do it. You know? And that, and I love this. I, I love what I'm doing. I'm creating content, which I feel is, making a difference, you know, so, but it is a challenge to try to do it without being, you know, the messenger that they want to shoot. <laughs> right. You know? Well, yeah. So I feel you. I, I, in 2021, so here's an embarrassing story. I have not admitted publicly anywhere. I'm happy to do it here. Uh, I was absolutely convinced that the food supply was going to collapse. You know, we were seeing all these stories about food packaging plants getting blown up. And I was like, oh, my they God, were this, is blown the, up. this is sorry. They were getting fucking blown up. They were. Oh, yeah, they, they totally were. Right. <laughs> and so my conspiracy theorist mind was extrapolating from there. I was like, OK, this is the next stage of the apocalypse that we're going through. Right. <laughs> so I spent thousands of dollars on emergency food for me and for my family because they they wouldn't do it you know mm -hmm. and you know i was just stockpiling so like i became a crazy prepper you know <laughs> in my in my tiny little apartment i don't have space for any of this shit right but i was yeah. just completely convinced and i i was so depressed i really i, I never really got scared about covid but i was scared to death about this yeah. and i i was really just looking around my my neighborhood and like saying goodbye like this is all you know it's wow. going to turn into a zombie apocalypse and you know and so <laughs> i really um like let go and i'm like well fuck it you know if this is the end i'm going to start doing the things i've always wanted to do right so i signed up for this hardcore meditation retreat and nice. I signed up for acting classes and tennis nice. lessons and all this other shit that I had just been putting off forever because I was too busy. And then the world didn't end, but, <laughs> but my world ended because I suddenly realized what life is really about. It's about hmm. meditation and acting classes and tennis lessons <laughs> and having fun. And like, I was, I was eating out. I'm like, Oh fuck it. I'm going to just, I'm going to just spend money like, you know, like crazy because it, you know, live. Or I yeah. want to live. I want to live it up. And I was having so much fun for the first time in my adult life. I was just relaxed and allowing myself to just have a blast. And I realized, oh, shit, these conspiracy theories, you know, have made me fucking miserable. Yeah. And, um, and I don't want to live like that anymore. And so that was that was such a profound shift for me. Um, and, and since then I've been just totally prioritizing 
you know, w w being a little more financially responsible, but, you know, prioritizing my own, you know, well-being. Yeah. Um, and realizing that um, I'm not doing the world any favors if I'm stressing out <laughs> no, about not. the the, U the UFO cover up and the bad guys. And I'm just I'm just I'm just perpetuating this this dialectic, you know, and, 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 you know, and Danny Sheehan says to me, like, Michael, we have to, we have to transcend this. We can't be in a, a good yeah. versus evil dialectic no. with the people controlling the UFO programs because they've got all the technology and they're going to win. So we have to, we have to transcend that, that dialectic. And, and, you know, we, it's the same thing that Greer says, like, we're going to do this through frequency and consciousness and manifesting yeah. a better world. And they're both absolutely right. You know, there's no, there, I, I often imagine this movie that I want to create one day. I, it'll never get off the ground. They'll never let me make it, but it, it, it would be like the United States military versus the military industrial complex the air the, the underground you know i always think remember that story of that dr Gert tells of when uh the five-star general eisenhower went down and was like you're gonna open that fucking door for me you know or, or i'm gonna fucking send the 101st airborne division to break it down and they were like all right all right just yeah. show them some you know show them some stuff and and then put the rest of the stuff away and but like, imagine if that came to blows, you know, um, and it almost did, but they ended up showing them, you know, probably a fucking broom closet. But, um, but I, you know, like I have these crazy ideas about what would happen, but they have all the technology. Let's be real. You know, they, they have, they have the power, um, and the technology. So we need to transcend it and, and it's not going to be done by pointing fingers and trying to, you know, all, all these people are like, they're going to burn in hell. I'm like, uh not helping maybe for a not, few minutes well, you know you know <laughs> yeah you know um but but i don't i don't you know i, yeah. I just don't think that's going to solve anything and i don't and i people are like well what even at the press conference someone said what a, you know billy carson someone who yeah. i've had on my show asked dr Greer, and it's a good question and it's a question people want to know because we live in this duality you know people are like are they going to be held accountable and i'm like and, and I love Dr. Greer's answer. He was like, right now, we're just trying to get them to talk to us. You know, we're trying to open up lines of communication. He was like, we're not, we don't have any plans to fucking have tribunals and yeah. Jesus, you know what I mean? Like, let's let them come out of the shadows before we try to, you know, fucking handcuff them and throw them in prison. Then we'll never get the keys to the, to the, yeah. you know, the, the, the locks that they have, the safes. Good luck you know, handcuffing like, someone who possesses literally magical technology you know yeah yeah um yeah. And, and and unlimited wealth and power and probably <laughs> off-planet infrastructure yeah, yeah. It's a, go, just go, in case you thought you could corner them <laughs> go go knock on their door and you know serve a warrant um but yeah you know you mentioned eisenhower if people don't appreciate like how weird it is for an outgoing president to use his last moments, his final His farewell speech, not to brag about his accomplishments, yeah. but to issue a warning, you know, about the military yeah. industrial complex and a scientific and technological elite. What do you think he was talking about? You know, it it's because he lost control of this, you know, he did. And he told Kennedy, you yeah. know, he let Kennedy know and Ken Kennedy knew more than most, probably was the last president to really have a lot of knowledge about this shit, you know, too much, probably not. I mean, too much, so much that, I mean, he was killed for a thousand reasons. Let's be real. But, but, but this was one of the reasons, you know, one of the bigger reasons, poor Marilyn, oh, sure. she yeah. didn't know what she was signing up for that poor, poor woman. She did not, she did not, <laughs> you know, um, it's just, a, but you know, what they did to him is the same parties, you know, that came back around for nine 11 and the same parties that orchestrate all this madness. And, and the, I'm, I am of the, and a lot of people don't agree with me, but I, but I believe that, you know, that this planet and, and we humans, we are angels, you know, we, we are meant to be 
angels. And we have been subjected to such terrors and trauma that we have, you know, been completely convinced that we're living on hell when this was meant to be a heaven, you know, and I, but I think that's what, what is inherent in all of us is good. It, it, it's not this bullshit that they teach us that we're, you know, you have original sin and you need to be fucking first thing that happens is you get an exorcism. Oh, great. We're, so we're, we're exercising babies now. You know, like that's basically what the baptism is casting yeah. out. Yeah. I'm like, what, what the fuck is, and I was yeah, raised. It's, like, it's psychotic. I mean, it it's, it's, it's completely psychotic and I, I have religious trauma. You know, I mean, I got off easy. It was just Catholic education, but a lot of our evangelical brothers and sisters, I mean, they're yeah. they're just you know what they're taught is so it's it's such a terrifying way to go through life Terrible. you know there's a, there's a devil lurking you Traumatizing. know yeah and again if you if you tr try to you know there, there's so many ways to do it through different meditation traditions through plant medicine uh, through chanting, even through certain kinds of prayer um, and other things, like if you participate in a direct experience mm. with the divine realm, you realize that um, every everything is perfect. Yeah. Like everything, everything is completely fine, and there is no reason to be stressed about it, stressed out about no. any of this shit. You know, um, the first time I did a, a mushroom ceremony, uh, I was laughing my ass off at the end of it because mm -hmm. I felt like I've been let in on on the big cosmic joke. And the yeah. joke was on me because I took everything so seriously when really we're just in this divine simulation and mm -hmm. and everything is just love. Yeah. Um, and then I just became obsessed with, you know, trying to access that as as often as possible, yeah. you know, and I've had more profound experiences in meditation than even through psychedelics, but psychedelics are yeah. a fantastic way into this, you know, yes. um, the, this is, this needs to be our, our priority, you know? Yes. I, I, I talk about it often. I encourage people. I'm like, you don't want to hear it, but are you, have you start, have you begun to still your mind enough that, you know, if you happen to try and talk to God, that you, you are, are you being quiet enough to actually hear an answer? Because you will get an answer. You know, if you, if you, you can talk to God anytime you want, you can talk to Jesus, you can talk to the archangels, you can talk to whoever you want, but you got to be quiet enough to hear the answer, you know, and then trust what you hear. Oh, it's, I, I heard it, but it was in my voice. Well, what voice would you like to hear? Would you like to hear the voice of Moses? You know, um, would you like Charleston Heston to speak to you it, it, in Godfrey. the same voice that he, yeah. you know, I mean, what do you, what, what other voice could he talk to you in, but your own? Yeah, I, I, it, it's amazing to me. You know, I, it makes me think of uh, one of my favorite books, uh, Conversations with God. If you haven't read it, you'll love it. By Neil I Bob haven't Walsh. read it. Oh, you'll love, you'll love it. Read conversations with God. It's an amazing piece of, it's a dialogue. Okay. It's a dialogue. This man had this, this cranky old man who was at the end of his rope, <laughs> he picked up his legal pad and he wrote an angry letter to God. And when he went to pull his hand back, his hand stopped and he was like, what? Oh shit. <laughs> and it started writing a response. And it was like, are you just venting or do you really want answers? And he was like, um, um, both, I, I both. <laughs> and really, and this, this, is, this is what it is. I've heard of, I've heard of this book. I know it was super yes. popular with like, this is how it started generation. on a legal pad. Yeah. No, like, like literally this, this old dude divorced six times, writing a fucking angry letter to God being like, why, 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 you know? And, and then try when he went to pull back the pencil, it stopped and, and started writing a response to his shock. Wow. You know? and, and and these legal pads then became, you know, this communication he had. And then, you know, this higher power said, you're going to have to publish these. And he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? 
are you serious? He's like, we're not just having this conversation for us. But listen, when you read this book and you read the answers, listen, I, I've read Neil's writing and it ain't that good. Okay. I mean, I love the man. He's, he's amazing, but he's not that good of a writer. The answers that he gets from this, you know, from this entity, um, from, from God, who this, like, he, you know, it, they're just perfect. They're and there was perfect. no chat GPT back then. So it couldn't, and there have been was that. no chat GPT, you know? So, so it, it was right from, I, I believe it was right from this. I've read the books. I've read each of them, a, you know, three, four times. And I always return to them because they grant me, there's, there's such a feeling of relief when I read these books, you know, all right, I'm ordering, talks, I'm ordering these as soon as we hang up. Oh, you're going to, you're going to laugh. You're going to cry. You're going to love them. It, they're, they're fantastic books. Um, but, but he always talks about in, in this book, he's like, if, cause Neil asks all the questions you would think that, you know, if you had a Q and a with God, what would you ask him? Be like, why don't you just appear? Why, why can't you just, and God is like, if I appeared to you as one thing, the moment you went and told your friend, Johnny, he's going to say, that's not what God looks like. You know, he's not, not going to believe you. He's going to say, because it says here in my book that God appeared like this. And if I appear one way, how, you know, there's, there's always going to be a problem with the way I appear, you know, but I am in everything. I'm always up there. And it's just like every, every answer. I mean, I didn't do it much justice, but it's, but it's very, very laid back um and laid out for you so you can't it's beautiful it's a beautiful book the answers are perfect you'll you'll see what i mean when you read them it's brilliant far so, out dude i'm i'm excited to read that yeah have you have you had jeffrey yeah, martin yeah. on your show no jeffrey martin well, he sounds familiar so this guy's a um, psychologist dr jeffrey martin at um Sophia University at some some university in Northern California. Um, and so like 30 years ago, he wanted to study enlightenment. You know, he wanted to start really sort of mapping out the spectrum of enlightenment experiences that people from different meditative traditions were describing. And he realized that not everyone was experiencing the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. it was, so he, he called them locations, you know, location one, location two, location three, location. It was like it was like 15 of them, you know, and they're they they run the gamut, you know, and it's it's really wild. And he called it he didn't call it enlightenment. He called it persistent, non-symbolic experience. But that became too technical. So now he calls it uh, fundamental well-being. And. And then he's like, well, we should figure out which techniques can most reliably transition somebody mm -hmm. uh, into a state of fundamental well-being, um, you know, the fastest. So they did these things called the finder's course experiments for 30 years wow. with thousands and thousands and thousands of people trying hundreds of techniques. And they've got it down to like 20 core techniques. And they learned some very interesting things. So number one, um, a technique might not be compatible for you that's super compatible for me, right? And a technique, a meditation technique that's compatible for you will transition you into fundamental well-being within two weeks. So you've wow. got people who've been meditating for 40 years waiting for something to happen. Yeah. You know, and they're like, oh, I know this is the day and it doesn't happen because it's just not compatible with them, right? The other thing they learned is that if you're meditating for less than an hour, you're wasting your time, which is so annoying, right? Because who yeah. wants to do this <laughs> for an hour, right? So, uh, cause something kicks in at the 40 minute mark, right? Which is when it starts, oh, you know, something's really happening. So, after 30 years and thousands and thousands of people, they've now got this like six week program. Wow. Um, and I, I did this program and on day two, um, I, I, I was, I, I did the meditation in the morning 
it was mm-hmm. super annoying. I, I, I could barely sit still for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I got through the hour. I went to the, a meeting in Hollywood with a screenwriter who was just like screaming at us. It was like super stressful. I get in my car to go to the next meeting and I'm just driving down to Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> And all of a sudden, again, this is day two of this program. All of a sudden, everything got really quiet and and kind of like felt like it kind of slowed down. And I was just overwhelmed with this sense of everything is perfect. Just the the sense of like divine perfection, right? And I'm like, what the fuck? And I I pulled over in front of like Chick-fil-A. And I'm just sitting there in my car, completely blissed out of my mind for for like three hours. And I had to pull myself out of it because I had to, like, I had to go to work, right? Right. Um, I, and, um, and so that, that program changed my life. And, you know, a, as a result of doing that, um, the way they describe fundamental well-being is the background noise of your life goes from being anxiety, like fundamental not okayness, mm-hmm. to fundamental okayness. So that's your mm-hmm. baseline. So as someone who had was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder and put on all kinds of medications forever, mm-hmm. I, I never thought that I, I didn't know what it would even felt like to not have constant. Yeah anxiety is the background noise of my life. So, um, it, it's called, it's called the finders course. I, I cannot recommend it enough. It's so amazing. And, um, I totally recommend having Jeffrey on cause he could talk about this way better than I can. But, um, that's where like, anyone who's listening to this and is like, Oh, maybe I should meditate. That's where you want to start because you, you don't want to just, in my opinion, you don't want to just go learn TM and do it right. for 20 minutes twice a day. I mean, it works for some people, right. um, works for a lot of people, but, but I'll tell you, it's not even in Jeffrey Martin's top 20 techniques. I wouldn't have guessed it would be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I learned from Dr. Joe Dispenza. Uh, I was an, oh, one nice. of his earlier students and, and, you know, and I was on the fast track because I was, struggling a lot in my life with, with addiction and a lot of self-loathing and, and, and I, and, you know, as an actor, I was like completely emotionally fucking constipated. And my acting coach was like, dude, you got to find out why you built Fort Knox over your heart. And I was like, yeah, I fucking do. (laughs) Um, And I, that's what kind of put me on this mission, which started with, you know, typical therapy. And then, you know, if you're on a mission to open your heart, you don't realize it. If you, you know, I thought I was doing it to become a better actor. I wanted to be the next fucking Marlon Brando, but it's a noble mission. And inevitably it's a spiritual mission because um, that's what I believe we're, we're here for. And if you can learn to open your heart, you could start to learn to love yourself, you know, regardless of what you've done or what you are going to do. And, and that's kind of how I found, ended up finding Dr. Greer and his work. And I was so, it resonated so deeply with me, um, along my journey at the time, but it's, uh, it's amazing how you can go from, you know, a base level of (laughs) quasi misery, depression, and anxiety to learning how, what works for you in order to just completely flatline those things. And then once in a while things happen, of course, you know, you're a human being living on earth at this time, some things, you know, are going to, get your heart rate up, you know, but, but coming back to it, always coming back to it is a practice and you can quiet those voices. Um, this is what people I think don't realize, you know, we have a lot of voices in our head and most of them aren't ours. You know, they're fucking old programming. They're adaptive programming from trauma and, and they're not doing us any good. So when you learn to quiet them, then you can start to rewrite your destiny, you know, as you, as you move forward, that's what, that's what I did. Um, and that's why I'm here talking to you. So it's, so it's, 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 but it's possible for everyone. And I'm going to definitely check out that. I had no idea that, that, that this study was done. This is amazing. I, I'm going to check it out. Talk about Amen, it. Amen, brother. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, you try like 20 different techniques in six weeks, you know, and it's like every hour, every day. Cause it's like 
hurry, we got to find, we got to find the technique for you, you know? And, yeah. uh, it's, it's, you know, it's hard, you know? Um, but once you find, and, 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 and like 85% of people who do it will transition. Mm. And then for the other 15% who don't, they've got a follow-up six week course and a hundred percent of those people transition. Wow. So in, in the end, everybody gets to, you know, like you get a spiritual trans- practice that fucking works for you. It fucking that. works in a few Amazing. weeks, you know? And I have so many friends who are like, oh, that sounds nice, but you know, an hour a day. It's like, yeah, an hour a day for like deep inner peace and talking yeah. to God and, and literally feeling like you have no problems. Yeah. You know? Yeah, brother. So I wanted to ask you, man, what was the most hard, what was the hardest thing to cut? I mean, I know as a director, this is, there's always more than one, but the hardest thing you had to cut from um, both unacknowledged and close encounters. Was there, was there something that stands out for both of them? You were like, no, oh, we have to shit. leave that in. But then for whatever reason, you know, Oh man. You had to I mean, unacknowledged it. was, you know, that was like seven years ago. I was editing that I'm trying to remember. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Um, what about the lost century? Lost Century, we had a story about that was we so we always have to put these movies in front of um our E and O attorneys, uh errors and omissions oh, to yeah, make sure that we're yeah. not gonna get sued, you know? Mm-hmm. It's kind of funny because we, we say some crazy shit in these movies. So they're like, you know, for, for close encounters of the fifth kind, they're like, Well, what evidence do you have that the Prince of Liechtenstein wants to start a war with aliens. And, and we're like, oh, well, here's our documentation, you know, and they actually yeah. like let us keep that one. Right. So I guess it was good enough. But for Lost Century, we had this whole sequence about this inventor who mm. worked for General Motors and he uh, he invented all kinds of patents for them. And then he invented, um, you know, an engine that would just run forever that didn't require fuel yeah. or maybe it was a water engine. I don't remember. Um, and, uh, but basically it was, a, it was like a ZPE. Uh, yeah. It was a zero point energy device. Cause even, even the engines that run on water, it, they're not really running on water. They're, they're, they're using water to tap into a zero point energy field. The Toronto field. Yeah. 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 So, um, and he thought, oh boy, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna love this. And you know, according to the story, uh, they pretended to love it, um, and then they they killed it, you know. And then mm-hmm. you know there were threats against him and his family, um, like mafia like tactics, and we we couldn't back it up, you know. Um, we yeah. we had X number of sources. Um, and uh, we we dug up like we even we even resorted to digging up old articles about like similar yeah. things that General Motors had done. You know, that was like in the yeah. L.A. Times, New York Times. Yeah. And the, the lawyers were like, we're not comfortable with this. So we're like, OK, fuck it. It's yeah. it's it's out. There's enough shit in here. You know? Yeah. So there was enough and, shit in it. But yeah. Yeah. And um, with CE5. Um, yeah, you know, there was, um, yeah, there was a a fantastic sequence. We even created, um, some great effects for it. And, um, it was with my best friend, Adam, Adam Curry, um, sort Mm. of riffing on the, uh, the plant experiment. So for the people, people who don't know, so, um, Adam is a consciousness researcher. He worked in the Princeton Pear Lab where they were studying consciousness and the effects of consciousness on physical uh, systems. In other words, you know, yeah. telekinesis, you know, and and yeah. uh, and telepathy. And they use these machines called random number generators, which, mm-hmm. you know, you can think of it as like a coin flipper, except instead of heads or tails, it's ones or zeros. And because it's truly random over time, you get 50% ones and 50% zeros. 
But if I say, Faust, use the power of your mind to make the machine produce more ones or more zeros, we find that this random process becomes ordered, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll spit, you know, so if I'm, if I'm flipping, you know, a coin and it's heads or tails and I say, okay, Faust, make me flip heads and I flip 10 heads, it's a coincidence. But if I'm flipping millions of heads, at some mm -hmm. point we have to say, okay, some outside force is interfering with an right. otherwise random process. So that's, that's what they found with these machines. So in the movie, Adam talks about an experiment he did where they, um, they put a, a, a plant in a room. Uh, it was divided into four quadrants. And they put it in one mm -hmm. quadrant and they had this sun lamp that was on a rotating arm and it was controlled by one of these random number generators. And so it would just kind of randomly move throughout the room. And because it's truly random, it spends an equal amount of time in each quadrant, except right. the plant, uh, the, the quadrant where the plant was in, um, attracted the light to it, right? So it spent statistically, a statistically significant um, amount of time in that quadrant. So in this segment that was cut from the movie, he kind of extrapolates from that mm -hmm. and, and says, you know, um, we look at the universe and there are all the, like, you know, you could look at like the creationist versus evolution mm -hmm. arguments and, and the creationists, you know, um, point out that there are all these physical constants, you know, the, uh, uh these, um, these these conditions in our universe that make it perfect for life that statistically is so unlikely it's 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 like 10 to uh, god knows how many powers it's right fucking impossible it's literally it's fucking impossible yeah. and so the the evolutionists they they the, their counter to that is like well yeah sure but we live in a multiverse and there's just an infinite number of universes and we just happen to be in the one where all those conditions were right. Well, <laughs> Adam suggests, well, you know, if you look at this plant experiment, it's like the consciousness of the plant is bending the, the probabilities of its yeah. environment, right? Mm -hmm. in, in favor of the, the development of life, life. Yeah. Yeah. right? And so if this is what consciousness does, in the universe, right? It mm -hmm. bends the probabilities of its environment to promote the development and thriving of life, then that means that life has developed throughout the entire cosmos. It's not this, it's not this rare thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. And so it was a really kind of like cool long sequence, but it just it just got cut for time. Yeah. Now I I I I've seen Adam and I'm always like, I got to get a hold of that man somehow because I would love to talk to him on my on my show. Um, I'll hook you up. Oh, awesome, bro. That's yeah. I appreciate that. He, he's he's so articulate. Um, and um, I, and I'm always like, I want to know where he's I, he, I see he's at a lab, <laughs> you know, or, or at least that's the background. But I, but he talks about his experiences and I've heard him speak on more than one, you know, show and documentary. And I'm like, man, I got to talk to him because. The, the experiments he does talk about, you know, um, they sound right up my alley, you know, and there's been some remarkable experiments done. And, and of course the debunkers come out of the woodwork, your former self, you know, like there was a Rene, Rene Piosh did this incredible experiment with these ducks and a random, he had a random movement generator. And what he did was he dressed it up like a, like it was just a robot, but, but he, he made it look just enough like a duck and he hatched these baby chicks and he, he put the random number generator divided into four quadrants and he, and he turned it on. And of course, you know, it moved at random, um, and basically covered all four quadrants about equally. Then he hatched the baby chicks and he let them imprint on this random movement robot. And then he put the baby chicks behind this screen behind one of the quadrants. And so the baby chicks could see what they believed was their, their mother, but they could not go to it. They were fenced off. 
And then he let he turned the the random movement uh, generator on the robot on again, and the fucking machine stayed almost seventy five percent closer to the ducks the whole time. And and so people, you know, like the 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 implication is that the the these baby chicks with their desire and love and and this this primal love they have um, for the, for this machine that they've imprinted on it, they're affecting its movements because here's the before it's like everywhere and here's the after it's close to the to the chicks and i'm like if a baby chick can use its heart and mind in, in as primal and and as simple as it is to affect a, a, a random movement machine imagine what you can do as a human being and people are like well that experiment has never been reproduced i'm like yeah. listen it, it can be reproduced. Just do the rice experiment in your kitchen. You know, That's right. I mean, you can, anyone can do the rice experiment. People are like, I don't believe in it. I'm like, why don't you fucking try it? <laughs> yeah. Before you believe in it. Exactly. It's like you, you fucking reproduce it. Um, yeah. You got to have Adam on and you got to ask him about the raccoon experiment. I won't spoil oh my God, it, I will. but it is, okay. so, it's so amazing. It's just as good as the duck thing you but it's different. It's very different. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's fucking mind blowing. Um, it's about these raccoons that form a belief system and a ritual and are manifesting stuff. It's crazy. It's crazy. Wow. Um, and and it's a good time to have him on because he's about to publish, uh, an amazing paper, um, about, uh, an update to the Turing test that he's calling, uh, T2 or Turing two. Oh, cool. And uh, he, he's suggesting this as a new uh, standard, you know, for AI. It's crazy. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah, I'll hook you guys up. Oh, awesome, man. That'd be so cool. Uh, I yeah. would love to talk to him. But, brother, this has been amazing. I, this is like, I just never thought that I would ever get a chance to to, to speak to you, to speak to the director of, of my absolute Dude, thank you so much. <laughs> you know, it's so cool, man. It's like a dream come true. It's uh, I'm I'm over the moon. I, I'm I, so much respect and love for you. You're extremely humble. You're doing amazing work, and I'm sure it's going to continue. What's um? Is there is, is there does the next doc have a name? Can we look forward to it? How can would you like me? Is there somewhere people can find you if they want to keep up with what I will come? Doing? I will come on here when we drop the trailer. It'll be in a few months. I want to have you to LA for the premiere. Oh, it's going to be you, fucking sick. It's the best thing I've ever done. It's so I'm super stoked on it. It's a lot of fun. We got the new witnesses from DC and we got some other stuff oh, in there. Man. Some people who've never come forward. Um, we've got insane phenomena images in here. Um, we've got Greer in here. It's going to be, it's going to be wild. I can't wait to hang out with you here. Awesome, um, thank you for having me. Yeah, this You're, was a blast. It's so thank cool. You We're for fucking on. friends now. So yeah, absolutely, bro. Yeah. We're friends. I'm I'm super excited. I'll reach out to you when this is gonna this is gonna premiere, and you know we'll keep you posted on everything. But thank you so much for your time, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Cheers. We'll, we'll be in touch. Cheers, bro. Thanks Bye. so much.